Hi there, everybody. Welcome to Digital Marketing Futures. Um, firstly, who are we? Um, we are one of the largest independent digital media agencies in the UK, made up of over 100 experts helping clients across all sectors and regions around the world. Now, for those that don't know, we are powered by a top 10 global localization agency called We Localize. In total, we are 2,000 people across the world passionate about helping businesses expand their share domestically and globally in every market and every language in the world. And here's a brief summary of what we do. So as I say, we are over 100 digital marketing experts covering SEO, paid media, analytics, conversion, content and transcreation. At the center of all of these specialisms, we pride ourselves on partnering with clients to help them evolve their digital marketing and help them grow market share by putting specialists in front of you that can help address specific digital marketing requirements. Be that strategic support, data management, technology, or even performance linguistics, which is understanding the performance of your translated content in different languages around the world. So just before we get started, a couple of housekeeping points. Um, the recording will be shared, so keep an eye out for that. Afterwards, it will be landing in your inbox on Friday. Um, please feel free to share it with colleagues and get in touch. Um, feedback survey, um, so we would love to know what you think of this event. Um, you'll be prompted to provide your feedback immediately after the seminar. Um, so all feedback helps, but let us know what you think. And finally, um, there's an email address there to get in touch with us if you want anything after the event. So what we're covering, so it's just a very quick welcome and housekeeping from me. Um, and then I'll be giving my thoughts on digital advertising in the future in 2030, um, followed by Vanda from Google, um, and finishing off with some case studies and a Q&A, which I'll host towards the end. Um, very quickly, just a quick plug, um, our next Digital Marketing Futures event um, will be Microsoft, and that will be on March the 24th at 4 p.m. So um, James and Murray will be with us. Um, so please come and join us for that as well. Um, so that's it for housekeeping. Um, and on to our main presentation. So what's on our mind? Um, what is likely to be on your mind? The future of advertising has been all over mainstream news last week or so, uh, specifically around cookies. Um, frankly, I couldn't think of a better time to have the opportunity to speak to everyone on my thoughts. Um, our industry is worth $600 billion plus, 50% um, of that is online. And open questions circulate our business here all the time. Like what threatens that model? What can help us grow share of advertising spend in digital further? There are all sorts of topics on here which we debate as an agency on a regular basis, and a lot of which are particularly relevant to my presentation today. Um, I think this quote puts it nicely, though. Um, it certainly feels very up in the air, doesn't it? Um, we're going to break down the key themes, um, and what I think will be the key topics that will shape our future. Um, and advertising in 2030 will be fundamentally different how it has been for the last 10 years. Um, however, do not panic, because for, mo for the most part, um, the same tried and tested methods will continue to work for a short while yet. And it is a far um, from an overnight change. They're not going away. But um, those individuals or organizations that fail to adapt over time will gradually, slowly but surely, fade out of relevance. They will slowly become less equipped to grow their employees and help them in their careers and therefore the business that they're a part of. As your customers increasingly embrace digital platforms, the challenge is on. The challenge is on for business owners to embrace the changes in advertising over the coming years. We all need to do this to continue to ensure that we are relevant and able to create new relationships with customers in cost efficient ways. And of course that applies to us. It's our job to ensure that we are relevant and able to create new relationships with customers in cost efficient ways on behalf of our clients. Our agency will gradually fizzle out if we don't 
and we would be doing a disservice to our team members and our clients. It's not only our jobs to be relevant, but it's our jobs to be best to forever debate in the industry, to embrace how it evolves. We make it so that your challenge is our challenge. So what does the agency of the future look like? What kind of skills do we need to support you, our clients, to deliver efficient and high quality advertising in the future? One thing I'm certain about and that we know is that advertising in the future will further require a multitude of different skills. We have this already, so SEO, analytics, UX, data science, but the requirement for deep specialism will only grow. Now and in the future, no longer will agencies be able to survive with rigid, siloed team structures, limited purely by the amount of knowledge an individual or a small team can gather. The same applies in-house. The skills required to develop and execute digital marketing strategies as a business will run extremely deep and are multifaceted. These are too deep for one person or a small group of people to master without suffering from jack of all trades mentality and gradually fading out of relevance and creating inefficiency in your advertising performance. So what's our vision? What is our agency strategy to support our clients through the evolution of advertising? Depending on their clients' challenges, agencies need to draw on many different disciplines to be able to support your growth. We can only achieve this by being set up to adapt to our clients' needs. This comes from being highly connected in our agency, with our partners to expand our skill set, and our clients. Second to that, we also need to be highly agile to ensure we assemble deep specialist skills and draw on them for our clients as and when they are needed to evolve our advertising performance. We of course assemble teams now, depending on our clients' needs, like paid media, analytics, SEA, but we will go further with this. By 2030, our business will need to be totally agile in our way of working with our clients, able to draw on those deep specialist skills, such as artificial intelligence and data science to create successful outcomes for our clients, depending on their strategic direction. We will always have core services to deliver, like paid media and SEA, but those core services will be very difficult to excel in without supplementary skills from specialists. The clues to the kind of skills that agencies need in the future come from trends and topics of conversation in the digital advertising space. One thing I will say before I get into these trend topics um, is that they are exactly that. Um, these are also my, my opinions on them today as the industry shapes around them. It's critical we monitor how advertising will evolve, but a lot of these topics are fueled by folklore. A lot of these topics are changing as the facts become clearer. I believe that in, we are in danger as an industry um, of having a really loud herd debate about some of these topics and that folklore is created to eventually become misunderstood facts. It's our job as an agency to monitor these topics, critique them and contribute to the conversation and take our stance to invest and ensure we support our clients in the right way as the topics become clearer. Being no doubt though, these topics are driving the future of advertising and we need to embrace the conversation. I'll be running through each of these briefly and the debates at the center of them. Marketing clouds. So um, firstly, before we talk about marketing clouds, let's talk about Google um, and Facebook, a row over privacy. We recently had the Apple announcement blocking Facebook tracking within apps and websites to fuel advertising data. Google have also been under pressure for some time due to legislation such as GDPR and PECA. This pressure has been rumored for a while now that it will result in the removal of cookies as a tracking method. This is materializing. Last year, Google announced their Chrome browser will remove support for third party tracking, which was legislation related. Google has been lobbying hard the industry for some time and using its power and weight in the industry to lead the conversation on the development of open standards to enhance privacy on the web. The industry is evolving itself, as it always does, to embrace these changing platforms or changing legislation. It's happened a lot since I've been in the industry. 
it should be no surprise to you that the big tech vendors are wanting to control that conversation. Google specifically and Facebook, they're in a great position. They have committed, um, Google have committed last week um, to not supporting an evolution of the cookie with alternative user level identifiers to track individuals across the web. Why? In my opinion, because smaller advertising platforms require these identifiers, cookies or not, to build up a view of individuals and build data sets on them. These providers do not have the first party data to model individuals themselves. Who does have a large amount of first party data to build profiles of individuals to target them? Google, Apple, Facebook, Amazon. This kind of change really has the potential to drive advertising budget away from smaller platforms into the walled gardens of these big tech providers. It could increase share of advertising budget going to large tech vendors with the data to accurately target people. Google have announced a move to targeting cohorts, flocks, rather than using cookies to cluster people. And that's all based on first party data that Google own. Individuals are assigned to cohorts depending on their user behavior. Google has confidence to move to this method because initial tests show that advertisers can expect to see at least 95% of the conversions per dollar spent compared to cookie-based advertising. So no tangible change in performance there then. The key to this, ev this evolution is the reduction in use of third-party data and increasing use of first-party data. Those with the data will win. So why are marketing clouds important? The way that big tech vendors see first party data as being important, you should as well. At the end of 2020, I did a talk on personalization and I wrote an article on the drum about it at the start of the year as well. Marketing clouds will become indispensable elements in advertising processes of the future. They control the creation and management of marketing relationships with your customers and manage campaigns. This is already best practice, but it will become standard to integrate solutions for customer journey management, email, mobile, social, web personalization, of course, advertising as well, and analytics. So watch this space, it will only become more relevant. Artificial intelligence is ubiquitous in the advertising space. We talked about Google's cohorts a minute ago. These are built on AI. AI supports decision-making and analyzes consumer behavior. Enriched with data about how consumers interact with advertising, it substantially optimizes campaigns to perform better. Implemented consistently and to its full extent, AI understands consumers better than they do themselves. I don't know if you've ever been spooked by seeing an ad after a conversation that you've had with someone and remain convinced to this day that, that big tech vendors are listening to you. They probably aren't, or at least I hope they aren't. It's just AI working its magic. This is very clearly tied to the performance improvements that we've seen in recent years by increasing our adoption as an agency of AI within campaigns. The large tech vendors will continue to embrace artificial intelligence because of the opportunity to scale, and of course in the future perform better than humans. As an agency, we hope to spend less time in the future on implementation of what we would consider as administration, like search query reports, and more time on strategic conversations with our clients to support their business growth. Programmatic, it's often understood as display, misunderstood as display. Um, actually, if we were to be pedantic, you could argue Facebook ads and Google ads are programmatic too. Um, I believe programmatic will be standard for digital advertising. Um, it is also the future of more traditional advertising methods. Think first party data collected through radio stations, something like Sonos Radio, and how that could be used over time for programmatic purchasing of audio. It's already used for TV and outdoor, so expect to see this more. Content. Digital advertising is predominantly contextual. This will grow. Cohort advertising is still contextual. Ads will be selected and placed by automated systems based on ever more detailed user profiles and the content displayed. There will be a continued increase in mobile and location-based advertising, which will strengthen this trend further. 
consolidation of tech. I believe the fragmented supply landscape that we have currently with an ad tech will consolidate. Large ad tech players will almost um, will require almost all of their smaller but highly specialized competitors who manage to evolve. Alternatively, and more, this is more likely in my view, is that these smaller vendors will be rendered redundant through policy and legislation evolution like we talked about earlier. The desire for improved services, additional scale and more first party data in particular will be the main driver behind any future M&A activity. And working with the right people, like the agency model's changing and the type of people we need in our agency will change over time too. Client side, supplier side, agency side, everyone will be competing for the same kind of job profiles. It will create a battle for the best talent and create a requirement to deliver the best training for your employees. Employers will compete for experts for scarce specialized skill sets. As is the case now, agencies and vendors will be breeding grounds for some of the best talents. And we have a responsibility to embrace that, that change and train people in their careers to create the best outcome for clients. But also the best opportunities for our colleagues in the future. So that demand for data scientists, analytics experts and creative minds it's huge at present and it will remain high or become even more competitive in the future. And finally, the decline of linear TV. So after print, um, which we've seen, traditional linear TV will lose its importance. Um, large digital platform companies generate similar reach through video on demand, social or messaging functionalities. This reach combined with first party data and AI will create incredibly efficient opportunities to reach audiences at scale through digital platforms. So that's it. Um, thank you. It was great to be here and share my thoughts. Um, I was asked to keep it conceptual and I hope I've managed to achieve that for you and give you some food for thought. Um, I absolutely love discussions around our future. If anyone wants to reach out after this webinar, feel free. That'd be really good to hear from you. Um, and over to Vanda. Thank you. Hi everyone, I'm Vanda. Um, I'm really excited to be speaking to you today about the future of digital marketing. Um, I've been at Google now for the last four plus years, originally working directly with CMOs and heads of marketing at SMBs, but now working with our top premier partner agencies in UK like ADAPT. Um, so today what I'm going to be taking you through are the top five trends that we expect to see in digital marketing going forwards, as well as what you can do as a business to adapt to that. But unfortunately for us to look forward, we actually have to look back. And that means that I do have to bring up 2020 um, and the year that it was. We saw a lot of profound social, economic and technological shifts with many of these changes that taking place were not fundamentally new. Um, in fact, it was the pandemic that acted as a catalyst to accelerate behaviors already underway. Um, and this is nowhere more evident than the increased use of digital technology across all aspects of our lives. So when we look to 2021, um, what that means is that the shift to digital is really here to stay and now is the time to assess uh, what this means for you and your digital marketing strategy. Now, barring any unexpected catastrophes, this is a year of transition as individuals, business and society can start to look forward to shaping the future as opposed to just kind of getting through uh, the year in front of us. So today I'm going to be taking you through the five trends that we are already seeing happening and we expect to continue through this year and beyond, um, as well as what that means for you. So perhaps the, the most obvious and all encompassing trend we see is this shift towards digitization. We've seen a huge change already when it comes to this, whether it's a growth in new users that are coming online and whether it's just consumers doing more and more of their lives online as well as businesses pivoting to offering their goods and service to meet this new need and new world. Um, these trends will have long lasting impacts on how we engage with the world around us and therefore, of course, how we change our marketing strategies to fit that. Um, probably nowhere has been more obvious and more clear with digitalization than e-commerce, um, which accounts for now you know, whopping 30% of all retail sales in the UK. I think in 2020 alone, we saw eight years of growth in three months. Um, in terms of this e-commerce penetration. And even when we look to the future and this post-pandemic world, this popularity and reliance on e-commerce looks set to endure. Pretty much every growth forecast you look at predicts that a high amount of stickiness 
to this behavior of e-commerce. The implication really being that consumers will continue to shop in the way that is most convenient for them. And during 2020, a lot of us discovered the convenience of online shopping. Even we look for uh, data from last year when the restrictions were lifted in the UK and across EMEA, we saw that uh, e-commerce trends were very promising with retail queries for many categories actually continue to grow because consumers were doing a lot more of their research and looking online before they were heading to the high streets. Even online sales are expected to continue to significantly exceed pre-lockdown levels because, as I said, consumers are just more used to shopping online and will do what is most convenient for them. The other thing that we've seen as well is this accelerated shift to uh, online across the entire consumer journey. You know, people are adapting to this online first approach. They are very able to switch between online and offline and create this kind of seamless customer journey for them. Um, we've seen this from an increased reliance on online discovery and research. In fact, this uplift in online research is driven mainly by consumers 45 years and over who are spending more time online discovering brands. Last year, we also saw a huge increase in that new to e-commerce consumer uh, for non-essential goods. Around one in three customers aged 56 and over purchased items online for the first time. In 2021, we expect these older adults to continue to grow more confident in their online behavior, whether it's through shopping or through discovery, um, and to continue to rely on the online journey. Now, it's also really important to remember that consumers don't think in terms of online and offline. Fundamentally, they are very happy to jump and move around these two worlds, which means that this will have an impact on how you look at your digital marketing strategy and how you also will need to blur the lines between online and offline. Um, we are seeing that it's not just consumers that are expected to do this, but businesses as well. We've seen a huge influx in new to e-commerce brands, whether these are brands that have been more focused on in-store sales in the past that have had to pivot, as well as brands going direct to consumers uh, as online only businesses. What this basically means is that it will get a lot busier in this messy middle as consumers have more choice and for brands it means increased competition in the digital space. So what can you do to kind of attack this first trend that we see in terms of digitalization? Well, businesses will continue to adapt driven by this increased digital adoption. In fact, 82% of SMBs have already changed how they operate their business driven by digital adjustments. One of the main things that you can look at to help you with this is consumer insights. Consumer insights will be central to your digital marketing strategy if they are not already. Um, one of the ways that you can do this is really paying attention to what your consumers are searching for and which vertical trends are rising fast so that you can adjust your offerings accordingly. We'd suggest looking at and, and keeping on top of trends beyond just your category, because what we've seen in the last year is that shifts in behavior in one sector actually have an enormous impact on other sectors as well. So do make sure that you're leveraging insights on top of your usual resources to help inform decisions and ensure your messaging is both relevant and helpful, helpful as consumers need this change. And you can visit our collection of tools here that I've just listed. So rising retail categories, Google Trends and Travel Trends to be able to keep up to date with some of that consumer behavior. Um, and just make sure that your digital marketing strategy is insight led and that you understand your market and consumer shifts. Another way that you can ensure your digital marketing strategy is insight led is through first party data. John mentioned it earlier on, and this is really crucial to kind of the future of, of your business. First party data is information stored and, and sourced from customers through CRM and other touch points. And it's gonna be a critical step to improving your overall digital marketing capabilities. You know, this data is unique to your business and will give you clear insight into your consumers, the types of products and services they ultimately want, and if used effectively, it will help you deliver more relevant experiences for them, as well as strengthen the relationship you have with your consumers and ultimately result in more conversions and a higher return on investment. So make sure you're actioning this now so that you can leverage your consumer data, as this will be the key to your success in 2021 and beyond. If you're not really sure how to do this, then of course speak to ADAPT so that uh, they can help you on this journey. The other thing to also bear in mind is that because people are spending a lot more time online and that has created additional complexity and a much more interconnected environment, things like machine learning and AI will be key. Um, it's going to help you give better access to signals and insights that you can leverage to form that deeper consumer understanding and also allow you to adapt your marketing quickly and efficiently to people's changing needs. So make sure that you're using the best of machine learning and automation 
um, whether this is looking at things like tools and technology that you can upgrade, whether it is things like smart bidding that will help you, you know, align better to your deeper uh, business goals like profitability, um, or it could be things like creative assets like responsive search ads that allow machine learning to provide more relevant messages to customers. And the other thing that you can do as well to help with digitization is just make sure that you are showing up across the entire consumer journey. As we said, consumers are blurring the lines between online and offline. So make sure that you are able to strengthen the digital journey for your customer. Um, consider moving beyond just pure performance and what you need to do to kind of help them with that awareness and consideration stage. It's perhaps time in 2021 to reflect on your existing marketing strategies and ask yourself whether the transition between online and offline is seamless for your customer, or whether or not you will need to innovate to meet their increased appetite for digital solutions. The second big trend that we see in uh, digital marketing for the future is this acceleration and increased consumption of digital media. Now, I don't know about you, but 2020 was really a boom for a video. We saw YouTube, TikTok, Facebook, Disney Plus, um, it was a great way to provide a bit of escapism from, from the year um, and also an important respite from boredom, a great way to connect with others and also to find community. Post pandemic, it is likely that our increased consumption, engagement and reliance on digital media will be here to stay. But in order to understand what your digital marketing strategy should look like to tackle that, it's important to understand who is engaging with digital media and why so we can see which trends will continue. So one of the things to note is that we've actually seen this shift to digital media across all demographics. Even with YouTube, it's not just kind of for millennials or Gen Z, but even older adults, so 45 plus, have seen a 20% increase in watch time on YouTube. We've also seen trends that were picking up pace before the pandemic to be accelerated by the pandemic. So things like live streaming, which has expanded across user interest to things like fitness as a service and to shop streaming. We've also seen trends like cord cutting, um, which is when you know households only use video on demand on TVs. So while some you know live streaming use cases like virtual concerts or workout classes may be less relevant in the post-pandemic world, live streaming as itself will definitely remain popular in many forms. At the same time, we also saw a huge sale of connected TVs in 2020, which means that in 2021 and beyond, more and more homes will be connected to and using streaming services like video on demand and like YouTube. Another thing to note is that you know binge watching and uh, shows or escapism on social media apps like TikTok and Netflix have and will continue to be a welcome distraction. Many people actually returning to digital media more as a source of news. Uh, as a source of education, whether it was learning skills like cooking or coding or financial management, um, or to help with their own well-being, not just to connect with others. So on YouTube, for example, we've seen a 50% increase in daily views for videos with beginner in the title as people look to self-improve and to learn something new. Um, we've seen a 70% increase in people looking for things like skincare and beauty hacks. In fact, views for beauty tutorials for over 45 year old people have engaged by 50%. Um, when we look at this older demographic as well on things like YouTube, we see that the reason they turn to YouTube is not just for entertainment, although of course they are looking towards it for entertainment and news, but it's also to learn something new. Um, in fact, one in three uh, older adult prefer to use uh, YouTube to, to learn something new um, and prefer to watch a video tutorial than to read instructions. And it's these trends that will sustain in 2021 and beyond. So whilst we might not be you know, preparing our own sourdough bread starter, we will continue to use digital media, not just for entertainment, to be, but become more self-sufficient in other areas of our lives. In fact, it is predicted that in 2022, more than 80% of consumer internet traffic will be driven by online video. And we've seen many brands connecting with consumers digitally in response to this. For example, retailers moving events online or retailers trying to live stream product launches and do shop streaming. Um, so what I would say is consider what strategy you already have in place to engage with customers as they consume more of this digital media and how your digital marketing structure facilitates that. Do you need to break down silos between brand and performance, video and digital? If we're seeing that consumers across all age demographics are turning to digital media, to inform themselves, to seek out new brands and to review new brands. Um, what are you doing to meet those consumers' behaviors? So one of the things to just make sure that you're keeping in mind for your digital marketing strategy is to be present where consumers are as well. 
um, given this media consumption, make sure you're able to keep exposure high and stay top of mind with consumers. Um, when we're looking at Google in particular, two of the best platforms that we can provide are things like discovery ads, um, which will allow you to surface ads across things like Gmail, YouTube, um, and the discovery platform and reach over 3 billion people as they're in that discovery mindset, as well as, of course, YouTube, which, as we know, is where many, many people are turning, not just to engage content, but also to use as a search engine. Um, so again, this just circles back to being able to meaningfully engage consumers across this online journey that they're taking. The third key trend that we expect to see in 2021 and beyond is this heightened brand expectation. Whether it's for transaction, educational, personal purposes, we are seeing that obviously people are turning more to digital channels for more aspects of their lives. As a result, they've really developed much more higher digital expectations um, across their categories. So we've seen increases in searches for this advanced consumer and customer service experience like live chats or virtual triumphs. We're seeing people turn more and more to apps because of the functionality and personalization they deliver. And we've also got increased expectations of things like next day delivery. What this means for, uh, for brands is that these trends aren't new. Um, these are not crisis induced flips, but they're an acceleration of already established trends. Um, so what this means is that this heightened expectation of the offerings that brands provide will be more and more important and will be a influence choice for consumers going forwards. And we're already seeing quite a lot of brands adapt to this. Consumers are definitely the, the driving force behind innovation with their increased appetite for digital solutions. Um, and many businesses have kind of turned to adapt and adapt fast. So a lot of businesses that were unable to open stores have focused online to deliver better digital uh, offerings. In fact, 82% of SMBs have been driven by this change. Even when we look at B2B businesses, we see a significant increase in demand for e-commerce information, web design and development, and customer service and support software. So we can even look to trends like AR, um, which have been driven through things like IKEA or beauty brands. Um, in fact, we already know that many consumers have devices that are AR, AR enabled. Um, so it's in our pockets, even if we real, might not realize it. Um, virtual customer service is also going to be more and more prevalent and as people get more familiar with things like virtual reality um, and obviously things like Zoom as well. So they will become more and more open to virtual brand uh, experiences there as well. And more than ever, we're seeing an increased expectation from consumers for this personalized experience when they navigate both offline and online. We see that a lot of people get frustrated when they have to repeatedly fill in their preferences or they are shown content, ads, videos, or products that aren't what they're actually looking for and not quite relevant to them. But as John mentioned earlier, we are rapidly shifting towards a cookie-less world. So this presents some challenges there as well. Um, what this basically means for brands is that brands will need to have a much bigger role to play and have an impact in able to be able to win uh, customers. Businesses will really need to embrace digital transformation to be able to keep, keep up, regardless of what vertical or size you're in. Um, you know, this is kind of the year to really, really do that. To meet some of those expectations, there's a couple of things that you can look to do as part of your digital marketing strategy. So first off is just making sure that your customer experience is a really key differentiator for you. Personalize that experience for them, whether this is through creating ads that resonate with each unique audience, and make sure that you are continuously testing and tailoring your, your assets and creatives with things like responsive search ads or videos. Um, again, don't forget that first party data that we talked about earlier, which will help you understand and engage with your consumers. At the same time, you will need to take action now to meet consumer expectations for privacy. It's also a good time in 2021 to embrace digital transformation as part of this. How is your user experience along their journey? How can you improve it? You can look at things like test my site to look at your site speed, navigation and service options. In many cases, the basics still aren't perfect. So it's a really good time to try to figure out how you can provide an overall better brand experience for your customers. Now, depending on where you already are in your digital journey, if you're more advanced, then how do you surpass consumer expectations? How can you invest in things like AR or virtual? We know that there's going to be a lot more need for businesses to go beyond just applying that digital lipstick, but actual true innovation and um, to make sure that they are putting customer expectations first and forefront of their lives. 
And finally, make sure that your brand matters. We've seen trends that uh, consumers care more and more about what their brands do in the wider world, whether it's sustainability or having a voice. And um, so whether it is, you know, making sure that you take actions outside of that or providing consumers with the best experience they can, this is a time to make your brand matter. The fourth trend that we're seeing as well is this cross-border consumer. As lockdown and logistic restrictions have really impacted consumer choice closer to home um, and the increased use of digital search to discover new brands, consumers have become more used to looking for whatever is available wherever it is from. So what that means is that for many consumers, this does mean shopping in a global marketplace. In fact, last year we saw uh, e-commerce or cross-border e-commerce jump by 25% in the UK. The reason why people are looking to uh, brands from overseas is because they are spending more time browsing the internet, and obviously discovering more products. It's been a lot more convenient for them shopping online. Um, and also there's been a lack of availability for products locally. So as we go into the year ahead and some of these uh, disruptions to logistic chains continue, this could be a really good opportunity for brands to look overseas. We know that international trade will play a key role in driving business acceleration in a post pandemic world. So now is a great time to look at diversifying your geographic strategies and um, seeing what you can do to diversify and capture global demand and future proof your business. In fact, 58% of brands are already looking to expand to additional territories in the coming years. You can use online tools like Market Finder to see what your potential is to expand your global reach. And again, you can speak to Adapt. Adapt is usually one of a handful of agencies that are Google partners for international growth. So they'll be very well placed to help you with your global uh, strategy. And lastly, the impact of financial volatility will continue. Um, it will hopefully continue to improve though, um, but it will definitely influence your digital marketing strategy. People have had to deal with furlough, with job loss, and just ongoing uncertainty. And because of that, we've seen consumers become more and more conscious of how they spend their money. Globally, the search for value for money is definitely a growing focus. People are more in favor of brands that are running promotions, offering flexible payment terms, or offering discounts. In fact, in the UK, 45% of UK shoppers say they expect retailers to offer discounts during this time. But it's important to note that it's not so much that uh, people are looking for cheap, but what they're looking for is the best value for their money. And it's this re-examination of our buying habits and increased focus on value for money that has also led to another trend, which is this interest in curation, looking for the best product that they can afford, not just the cheapest. So we've also seen kind of this explosion of product choice, which again means that consumers are increasingly searching for curated options. We've seen search interest for things like best lamp, best rug, best toothbrush, keyboard, et cetera, increase. We've increasingly been looking for subscription boxes for things like uh, drinks or snacks or even houseplants to simplify how we curate things and how we find the best that there is to offer. It's also been really interesting to see this accelerated trend of in the internet being used as a resource for experts to tool for price comparison. So what this means for brands is that brands should really be able to step up into this. Um, the online you know, arena definitely levels the playing field. Um, but what that means for you is that you can deliver value to these customers. Be conscious of offering the best, not the cheapest, whilst also being mindful of the increased need for discounts from people. In this world of abundant choice, simplicity becomes a luxury and curation is definitely a value add. You know, consumers are attracted to brands that uh, take the work out of deciding what is the best for them. Um, this also means that you should be helpful with consumers, help curate those choices for them. Again, this ties back to that personalization, helping them find out what is the best for them in that time of need. Um, and lastly, it also means that this will extend to your customer service, right? There's been an increase in this online research. People are looking at reviews more and more, and these reviews will highlight both the positives and the negatives of your online experience, your delivery, your product experience as well. So make sure that you are offering, you know, the best for your consumers as and when. So what does that mean for us? Um, basically it means that these consumer trends will be central to your digital marketing strategy going forwards. Um, it's really important to make the most out of this year and beyond. You'll need to embrace agility. Um, you'll need to make data analytics part of your business and provide customers with a more personal and seamless experience. 
now is definitely the time to reset, to pivot, and think big to transform your business operations to match new digital expectations. I'm going to leave you with these five key trends here, as well as the five strategies for 2021 and beyond. But of course, if you have any questions on what these trends mean and what these strategies mean for your business, please feel free to reach out to the ADAPT team or to myself afterwards. Thank you. Thanks, Banda. We're just about to pass over for some case studies, starting up with Rawad, I think. Over to yeah. you. Thanks so much, John. Hello, everyone. Um, so, yeah, lovely to speak to you all today. My name is Rawad Jamal, and uh, I am the b 2 Digital Director here at ADAPT. And the first case study that we do have uh, for you today is about one of our uh, B2B clients who they are in the um, SaaS business and they are an enterprise grade solution software that they wanted to expand uh, to a um, number of markets across uh, Europe and as well um, in Asia and in Latin America. They are um, US based clients. And uh, when we started actually working with the, uh, with the account, the, the main areas that actually we found them that they were actually a bit challenging in there, they were three main things. Number one, it was the account content as it was actually directly translated from English, which we see all the time when someone actually some companies they want to expand internationally, they go with the with the easier option within the, the direct translation, which we will be covering in a second as well together. And the other thing that it was in there, um, the fact that uh, lots of the um, B2B elements that the platforms they actually provide, they weren't actually fully utilized and especially connecting the, the online to the offline conversions out there and try to use really, as the guys right now uh, spoke about, like within the first party data, how actually you can enhance the campaigns that you have in place. And thirdly, um, the in measurement wise, it was focused only on the, uh, only the, the marketing KPIs out there and such as like from the lease to the to, to the uh, uh, cost per lead, etc. But it didn't actually look through the full funnel as well. What happens after this, and what's the impact of the overall business? So our approach was to deal with that. Is definitely number one is to deal with the uh, with the all overall content, and to just uh, utilize our expertise in the uh, digital transcreation. Now, when we speak about the digital transcreation, especially for the content and how is that different from normal translation, is that the fact that uh, translation focuses only on the accuracy of the translation with translating word to word, rather than on the other end, the digital transcreation would takes into account the messaging that you want to be um, putting out there for the, the local audience, especially if you are actually taking a message from the US market, let's say to the German market, and like how you would need actually make sure to resonate with that market. And number two, which is the, um, the, the idea of uh, doing more of a localized keyword research rather than actually translating the keywords that you have within the account. So that was the first thing that took into account to ensure that we do maximize the potential for the account from a targeting perspective on the keyword level, et cetera, and as well from messaging perspective that something that it's resonating with the market and we can track its performance and we can enhance them. The second thing that we put in place, which is having the balance between consistent sort of an account structure across all the regions, but putting in mind that every market, they, they have their own way of approaching that market and try to really see what is, um, when it comes to the share of us or share of market, who are the local competitors versus the global competitors and try to really adjust our strategy based on that. And uh, lastly, it was that within the, the continuous optimization for the account, and especially what we realized when expanding internationally, most of the time, uh, the, those accounts, after they have been uh, localized and worked on, they are not really as active in terms of the hygiene on, on them as, for example, the, the, the English ones. 
So these were actually the, the overall approach to, to have in this, that it's, as you can see from the our results, if we look into the, the left-hand side, after the, the setup, we had just a huge increase of the amount of keywords that they were really eligible to trigger ads versus the normal translation that used to be in the account. And the majority of them, they were actually lost or report key keywords because they focus mainly, mainly on only having the, the direct translation. And moving this to the uh, ongoing side of things, uh, where we start seeing as well a huge boost in the CTR because the messages there fitted within the targeting that actually we were going after, which as well get rewarded with a, a better quality score over time that led us as well to a cheaper um, CPCs that, that has been decreased. Now, taking this into the overall business impact there, where actually it's been reflected right away on the, on the CPA there, now, how is this uh, actually just a couple of takeaways for, for you guys, like how is this uh, applicable could be uh, for yourself? So three main things to be focusing on. Number one, if you are going international, avoid the direct translation and ensure that actually you have a native approach who is dealing not only from a language perspective, they are native, they are native as well by platform and they know exactly how to do keyword research within their own language and as well how to resonate the messaging. The second thing is that to utilize everything that the platform really offers and to link your online with your offline data and utilize your first data as well within this. And the third thing, which is to remember specifically in B2B, marketing is judged by sales. So meaning that it's not enough just to look from the KPIs from a marketing perspective and see what's the overall impact that all the activities you are doing are affecting in there. So I'm going to leave you with these three uh, main takeaways and thank you so much. Thanks, Rawad. That's brilliant. Um, next up is Bethan. She's going to share case study as well. Cool. Hi, everyone. So thanks, Rawad. Um, so the case study I'm going to talk about is um, our client Thought Clothing, who are a sustainable fashion brand, um, and all their collections are sustainably sourced and made from super soft fabrics like bamboo and tensile and organic cotton. And they're all sustainable because they're um, produced with less water and the fabrics are produced with less harmful dyes. So obviously, over the last few years, Sustainability has become way more important as people are getting a bit more, in inverted commas, woke uh, and starting to expect sustainability from their retailers. So there's two challenges really over the last year that have been big for thought. The first has been continuing to grow the customer base while in general retail, other retailers are starting to offer sustainable clothes as well. Um, and then also just a general change in the demand for fashion retail with lockdowns and events cancelled, people aren't buying clothes for those. And just a, a change in expectations of what people are expecting from their clothing. Um, there's no point pushing a ball gown in the middle of lockdown and we want to wear really comfortable clothes because we're working from home. So how did we approach this? So uh, like Vanda mentioned with the first party data, we used Thought CRM data to create audience segments, which we overlaid onto their search campaigns to drive a more relevant audience. We also identified that email had the strongest conversion rate of all of their channels. So uh, using the same CRM data, we created exclusion lists on campaigns that were just designed to push email signups for new users and then fill their email list with those engaged users. And then thirdly, in order to tackle the issues around the changing fashion demand, we used smart shopping and social campaigns that just pulled in just best sellers or high stock items or relevant product groups like loungewear, obviously, Loungewear became massive over lockdown. And we did this using custom labels in the feed, which we added bestseller labels and product type labels to. And then that allowed us to just pull in those products into product sets on Facebook um, and then campaigns on Google. And then finally, we started to expand out our search campaigns by broadening out the generic keywords that we were bidding on. Uh, typically, we'd only been running campaigns that had a sustainable keyword focus. So sustainable dresses or sustainable knitwear. So we decided to change the approach to push for more volume and go for a keyword rather than a, 
uh, go for a user centric rather than a keyword focused approach, essentially, where we let the machine learning find the user rather than lessening the volume um, and cutting out those um, only appearing for the ethical or sustainable keywords. And what were the results like? So year on year, we managed to increase new users by 106%. Um, and even though we obviously pushed a bigger portion of new users, uh, the conversion rate was actually 12% higher year on year. And typically new users have a lower conversion rate. Um, and then ultimately that resulted in a 104% increase in revenue overall. Which is great. Fantastic. Thanks, Beth. And before we um, move on to David, I just wanted to say it's um, the Q&A after this final case study. So if you can start sending in any questions, we've already had three, um, a couple of Google, which is brilliant. So please share any thoughts that you have and we'll try and do our best to answer them. Um, over to David. Um, I'm going to start with, uh, finish with the uh, glamorous world of conveyancing. So my home and move conveyancing are a sort of long-term partner of ours and they're the UK's largest online conveyancing specialists. So they've won a bunch of awards, they're fixed fee, and they're basically uh, trying to make moving house as hassle-free as possible. Um, obviously in lockdown, um, you may have seen the kind of housing boom. So Rishi Sunak's been... Uh, Removing stamp duty, uh, things like that. I think people have also been trapped in their houses thinking, God, I need to get a new one or stuff like that. So we're seeing a kind of boom in the housing market. What that's kind of led to is a bunch of yeah, pretty busy conveyances. So my home moves challenge, I suppose, is sort of cutting through the leads and making sure we're, we're capturing those sort of richer um, people who fundamentally want to buy bigger houses, live in bigger houses or whatever it may be. Um, so, what do we do? So, my home move actually do a pretty good job of uh, profiling the people that they've instructed before. And this goes beyond kind of where they live, how old they are. It talks about their professions. Uh, they try and capture a lot of information, so how many children they've got, etc. Um, and this gave us a kind of profile, if you like, of a kind of, uh, of the perfect customer we were going after. Uh, and we use Google's relatively new detailed demographics um, and we segmented what they had with their first party data and kind of matched them up with the sort of lookalike cohort if you like so as I said before the detailed demographics are going slightly further than your sort of entry level age gender location they're looking at things like whether they're renting whether they're homeowners whether people have two children three children how old their children are what industries they work in so we were able to essentially create sort of pots of campaigns, which we deem sort of high intent or medium intent, or if we're being a bit crass, the sort of richer, fatter people uh, and the people that we were slightly less interested in. Uh, so what that meant is we could sort of shoot campaigns um, and be a bit more aggressive. Uh, so we were getting fewer leads, but the idea is that they were better. Obviously, as well, uh, important that we kind of hyper detailed tr sort of tracking on everything, uh, pushing through UTMs, just making sure that the the high intent leads that were coming through were in fact turning into um, uh, yeah things with higher average order values essentially. So we had more sort of happy conveyances, and I suppose that's the main thing. That is the main thing. Um, it's lots of shiny results, so less leads, better ROAS, um, but so the most important thing is uh, the revenue increased. So yeah, thank you very much. Fantastic. Thank you, David. So we've um, got the Q&A next and we've started to get a log a question. Um, it's done within the platform. There's a question section so you can just write out anything that you want to ask there. Um, so I think, for, first of all, I think um, there's a question here for Vanda. Um, Google are testing alternatives to cookies. Are there any upcoming dates? Um, for, for more announcements on these 
be aware of any any holding dates from Google. Hey, um, no, nothing being announced at the moment, but I would say just continue to keep an eye out on the either the Think with Google site or the blogs that we have as well for any upcoming announcements. Fantastic, thank you. Uh, next question. So, um, this again is it's possibly one for you, Vanda. So, um, how do you see the digital swing shifting as the high street begins to reopen? How will Google be looking to tie up the activity of people researching online and purchasing offline or, or in showrooms? Yeah. I think this is a great question and one that a lot of advertisers and even Google themselves are, are asking. So what we've seen is trends from last year. Um, we looked a lot at what happened when lockdown restrictions eased in the UK, across India and in different countries as well. Um, that maybe didn't have such strict lockdown restrictions in the first place. And what we've seen that is, in general, uh, search queries will continue to sustain, if not rise uh, as well. A lot of the searches may pivot a little bit more towards local searches. You know, what stores are open, what is available in store um, to just kind of find out what is in their in their remit, like what stocks, etc, which is what we were seeing pre pandemic anyway, that people were turning more and more to things like Google Maps or Google search to figure out you know, if they are going into to town or into the city, can they find the product that they actually want? Can they find a better version of the product at a different price from a different store that's nearby? So a lot of that research will kind of come back in and continue to rise. Um, when we look at things like uh, pulling in the data from, let's say, offline sales, I think this is, again, that really big important part of that first party data. If you do have offline channels, then it's going to be really important for you to start pulling that data into your digital marketing strategy so you can bridge that gap between online and offline and understand, you know, if people are doing all the research online as they literally walk into your store and they might even be researching your products while they're in your store, how do you still attribute that in-store sale to some of the stuff that they've been doing online as well. Hopefully very that answered the question. That was awesome. Thank you very much. Um, so this this is we're just at the top of the hour, so we've got two couple couple more questions probably. Um, this is a question to and anyone on the panel. So um, the UK is slowly starting to open up again, um, as per the government steps that we've seen. Have, have any of the speakers started to see the travel sector? commencing advertising again? I can... Go for it, Vanda, if you've, if you've got a view, that'd be great. Um, yeah, and I think this is something that actually I've been speaking to Adapt about, and Adapt have been sharing their insights back to, to us here at Google as well. Um, but across the board, especially in the UK, we are really seeing the, the travel industry come back. And it's it's been great to see, because I know how challenging it has been for them in the last year. Um, I think in, in recent news, we've seen that 90% of summer holiday bookings have already been booked out. Um, and more and more people are searching overseas in uh, predominantly in, in Europe, as well as some searches in the US, as people are just getting quite excited about the potential of getting out of the house and, and exploring the world. So yes, we're seeing quite a lot more travel advertisers coming back online. Um, luckily, a lot of them have taken the time out to kind of rethink their digital strategy as well. So they're coming back uh, fully equipped to, to handle the challenge. So that's what we're seeing here at Google anyway. But I don't know if Adapt also want to add anything to that. I would probably yeah. say that, sorry, John. Uh, no, I, I would say that I have seen advertisers coming back into the space and I think it would be a, a, sort of the, the earlier adopters to that will be reaping the benefits because like you say, less advertisers mean kind of cheaper clicks, which means sort of, you know, in a, in a kind of crude way, um, you'll be, first, you know, first to the queue for people looking for book that trip away. I know I've been looking at holidays, so. Yeah, I think we've 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 certainly seen the domestic park market pick up um, very quickly, and and having an absolutely brilliant time of it as well, um, ever ever since the government announcement. So, looking forward to the international market picking up as well. A um, couple more points. Um, so somebody would like to know more about the cohort clustering versus cookie data. Um, I, I think the question is. Would Google publish what the cohorts 
are. That's not something that I think I've seen clarity on um, because we don't know how many cohorts there will be, to what detail there will be, how many individuals will be clustered. So that's not something I've seen, but is, is that correct, Vandy? You're not seeing anything else? I haven't seen anything on, on my side either. So um, yeah. again, I think it's just something to keep on top of because as we get more and more used to the cookie loaf world, I'm sure we'll see more information about that come about as well. Yeah, definitely. Thank you. Um, and final point, it's not, not strictly a question, um, but somebody on here is currently using my home conveyancing for a purchase and search as part of that process. Um, to using them, so clearly the case study is correct. <laughs> That's very kind. <laughs> cool. Well, um, that, that, <laughs> that's it. So th thank thank you very much, everybody. Um, I hope you've enjoyed the last hour. It's, it's been a pleasure to host you and, and have you here. And thank you to all of our our speakers as well. It's been fantastic.